Hello, and welcome to Lunch and Learn, the Leeds video podcast, where we take an in-depth look at the art scene here in Lincoln and the arts industry as a whole. As the United States continues to battle COVID-19 with rising caseloads and new restrictions in communities all across America, life has often felt out of control. It's hard not to feel alone when we're quarantining at home, isolated from our family and friends, but the good news is there is hope in the battle to overcome the quarantine blues, and it's actually quite accessible. Today, we'll be taking a deep dive into the psychology of music and looking at how the key to beating isolation is just a song or two away. I'm Ryan Savage, an education and outreach specialist here at The Lead, and here with me to discuss is my coworker and co-host, Brenna Zulman. Hi, Brenna. Hi, Ryan. So Brenna, what do you think? Have you been listening to anything that's made a particular impact on your mental health during quarantine? I definitely think there is a lot of science behind um, music psychology and there's definitely like a lot of evidence like even in, you know, everyday life. Um, like I think back to back in March and April when they were doing all those live concerts. I remember the Global Citizen Foundation did this huge concert. It was called Together at Home. It was like eight hours. Um, there were people from all over the country performing uh, all over the country. It was all over the world. Yeah. And um, I something that really just hit me like a truck was I remember Taylor Swift performed like an acoustic rendition of her song, Soon You'll Get Better. It was originally for her mother um, who's battling with cancer currently, but she, it kind of took on like a double meaning um, as, you know, the whole entire world soon you'll get better and yeah. um i just remember Clapping. sitting in my literally i just remember sitting in my living room and just crying and it was just such a healing moment and then you know i mean we all have those songs you know those certain parts of songs where it hits and you just get that instant burst of serotonin like um sweet caroline you know it's like sweet caroline ba, ba, ba. <laughs> you just like automatically are happy there's like no there's no way around it. You automatically just kind of get that like boost of serotonin in your brain. So I definitely think there is something behind it. Yeah. Speaking of Taylor Swift, um, we of course have to reference her new album, Folklore. And it was recorded in self-isolation, released on July 24th, announced just 16 hours before. And <laughs> I think everything that you're talking about in terms of music that we really need to hear, folklore really did that for a lot of people. The reception on social media and in the media was insane. And I think that people were just looking for something to, to cling onto and folklore really filled that, that gap. And I personally think it's her best album yet. It, it sounds mm -hmm. like, old Taylor meets 2020 Taylor, like teardrops on my guitar Taylor meets uh, modern Taylor. And it's a completely different sound. Mm -hmm. And it's an it album. Reminds... Oh, sorry. Oh, no, no <laughs> it's worries. An, uh, it's completely an album that she wouldn't have been able to make if it wasn't for this specific like moment in time, you know? Yeah. And it, it just reminds me of, you know, everyone says Shakespeare wrote King Lear and Macbeth during quarantine. So I guess this is um, Taylor's Macbeth. <laughs> But all this today leads to our first guest, Dr. Robert Woody, who is joining us live to discuss the psychology of music and how the music we make and the music we listen to have a physiological impact on how we cope with isolation. Dr. Woody joins us from the University of Nebraska, where he teaches courses in music ed and music psych. He's also a prolific author writing for the online blog, Psychology Today, publishing research in the psychology of music and the Journal of Research in Music Education and authoring several books, the newest of which I have here, Becoming a Real Musician, which you can purchase on Amazon and you can also find the link on our website. And it looks like, there we go. It looks like we have Dr. Woody with us. Hi, Bob. Hi. So good to awesome. be here with you. It's great to have you on today, Bob. Uh, I know Brenna and I are both really excited to dig into some of the psychology behind music. But first, can you give our viewers a preview of your new book? Um, sure, happy to do that. Uh, the title is Becoming a Real Musician, Inspiration and Guidance for Teachers and Parents of Musical Kids. And the first word of the title really gives away my orientation that I believe people become musical and they do so 
uh, through the right music experiences as children and with the right kind of support from the adults in their lives. Uh, also, the term real musician uh, is important. Um, a real musician, in my uh, estimation, is not necessarily somebody who studies it in college or makes a career of it. Rather, a real musician is simply someone who's able to participate in music in a variety of real life settings, including informal social situations. Anyone can, anyone who can be musical is a real musician in my book. Yeah, awesome. That That's really inspiring to hear that like anybody can kind of, you know, reach yeah. that point. It's like the um, Ratatouille and... moment. <laughs> <laughs> anyone can cook. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. And for our viewers, if that sounds like something you are interested in looking further into, you can find Dr. Woody's book on Amazon. It's also, there's gonna be a link published on our website to go ahead and look at that Amazon link. So Bob, there's so much stress in people's lives right now related to the pandemic, everything ranging from job security to taking care of our kids to our own personal health. It feels like our fight or flight responses are turned on all the time. Can you explain to our viewers what actually happens biologically when we're stressed and how we're yeah. impacted when we experience stress over long periods of time like we are currently? Yeah, what we're talking about is the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system or more commonly known as the fight or flight response. And um, the main thing to know is why this response engages and that's when we perceive a threat. Now in the moment, of fight or flight, there's little we can do to disengage that response. Um, but outside of those moments, I think there are things that we can do to be proactive, uh, working in our minds, uh, primarily to rationally decide what is and is not a threat to us. Uh, this rational approach is especially important to musicians in, in my world uh, who suffer from performance anxiety, because as I tell them, they're acting as though music is a threat, making music is a threat, when in reality, making music and sharing it with others is something they've chosen to do for themselves, and most of them would say they love it. Now, more to the topic of the pandemic, uh, there's uh, psychological research I've seen out there, out there that indicates when people spend a lot of moments in fight or flight mode, they can begin to generally operate in their lives with what's called hot cognition. And this is a state in which people's thinking is much more emotional and their decision-making is done very quickly. Uh, in such a state, people uh, tend to rely on the simplest beliefs they hold, even if they kind of misapply them. And as you might think, they're susceptible to functioning in a highly biased manner. So I think this could explain why some people seem to be living in fear throughout the pandemic, even though they are doing all they can do to keep themselves safe. It might also explain why some people have chosen what I think are obviously irrational coping strategies, like, <laughs> reject, like rejecting the reality of there being an invisible virus out there and instead fighting back against something that is more tangible, uh, even if in reality that is only an imagined threat. Now, admittedly, some of that may be conjecture on my part, but I think it's a, a possible way to apply the, the research on hot cognition. Yeah, I, I definitely, I definitely agree with you. I think that's something that we've seen and it's pretty invasive throughout all of society. Yeah, you know, right. people, people, regardless of maybe how they're portraying themselves on social media, how they're coping with everything. I, I think everyone's in the same bubble and experiencing mm -hmm. the same things right now and trying to figure out a way to navigate yeah. out of that. Um, but Bob, I know you've written a lot about how music can be a shoulder to cry on. Mm -hmm. What do you mean when you say that in terms of how music and music making can affect our yeah. physiological response to stress and anxiety? Yeah, well, if, if uh, what I said on hot cognition is the bad news, then what I get to tell you about music is the good news. Uh, okay, music, good. <laughs> music seems to be a preferred way, uh, one that people choose a lot. Uh, to cope with uh, emotional difficulties that they face in life. Uh, most turn to music, I think, intuitively, perhaps when things are not going so well for them in their everyday life, they may decide to listen to some blues. Or when they're dealing with the end of a relationship, they decide to listen to the many Taylor Swift breakup songs, right? <laughs> that, 
Yes. There, of which there are now many with folklore. Yeah. Oh, oh, are there more on there? Okay. Yes. Yes. It's it's a very it's a very sad album, I have to say. She, but she already she already had quite a repertoire of breakup songs, and now there's even more. So yes, I think people just kind of intuitively turn to these things. Now, from a psychological perspective, music seems to allow people to express and get in touch with negative emotions that they might otherwise repress. And as we all, I hope, know, repressing emotions uh, is not particularly good. Now, there is a critical difference, I think, between ruminating on painful traumatic events in your past and experiencing the negative emotions in a healthy way, which I would suggest music <clears throat> allows. Um, so in other words, music allows people to feel the emotions that they need to feel without reliving trauma, which can hmm. lead to uh, what psychologists call rumination, just constant replaying uh, a trauma in their head. And uh, not surprisingly, that goes along a lot with uh, post-traumatic stress and depression. Now, I would speculate, and I do often, that uh, <laughs> there is even greater psychological benefit uh, with making music as compared to just listening to it. So I would say if it's good to listen to the sad music of others, wouldn't it be even better to create your own? And there's much psychological research that, that has um, really shown that music participation can have powerful social and emotional benefits, including among marginalized individuals who commonly struggle with depression and other emotional problems. And there are uh, a number of music therapy programs out there um, some that I've recently uh, come in contact with through some other activities. There's one called Guitars for Vets and Songwriting with Soldiers. And these, uh, as it sounds, they specifically aspire to treat PTSD through music making and the results of such programs are very promising. So I just had a quick question. Yeah, sure. So then sad music, like listening to sad music or like, mm -hmm writing sad music isn't inherently negative on, on your psychological because I know that's something that a lot of people will say you know you, you see it on tv that that common trope of the 14 year old who's listening to sad music and their their parent is like stop listening to that it's you're just mm -hmm. you're just yeah, making it worse so yeah. yeah I think the 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 research suggests that there is a difference between you know, experiencing, you know, we need to feel our emotions, we need to process them, we need to be honest with them. And there's a difference between doing that by reliving a trauma, uh, you know, replaying it in your mind, uh, replaying the horror, so you can face the feelings. There's a difference between that and, and kind of processing and feeling the feelings in a, a way that's more healthy, and honestly, more safe. And I think music, uh, and the arts more generally, uh, are able to do this because we're able to kind of experience the emotions, but in a safe way. We don't have to actually be traumatized to feel sadness and um, and anger or whatever negative emotions we're talking about. Instead of actually being traumatized again, we can just allow the the art artistic material, the music, or whatever. To, to move us into those feelings. So it's kind of a, a, a safer way to feel the feelings we need to feel. And um, yeah, I think there's, and there's a lot. Yeah, absolutely. It leads to, to recovery. And I, you know, uh, Brenna said something about uh, the experience she had with uh, some uh, concerts she watched back in the spring where she found herself in her room kind of crying and, and you very quickly uh, described that as a healing process. And which I, I think is very insightful um, because, you, you know, you didn't sit in your room and just kind of ruminate about how bad things are and and kind of the the horrors of a global pandemic. You you let the the music that you experience kind of bring those feelings that you needed to process, bring them to the fore, bring them to the surface so that you could experience the healing that comes through acknowledging emotions. <laughs> Wow, I think you might have unlocked the door in my brain. Everything that, 
<laughs> everything i was just i was sitting there listening and like oh my gosh this is me especially that rumination part like i've definitely yeah. always been a person that has very closely associated music with different periods and times of my life and just like you know stuff that i needed so yeah that definitely i can see that in my own life um mm -hmm. So one of the things that we've all s seen a lot throughout the quarantine are videos of communities singing together from their windows along the street. We've seen this in both small towns in Italy and larger mm -hmm. cities like New York. We actually have a video queued up of one of these group numbers from New York City that we'd like to show you. A bunch of neighbors got together and sang a socially distanced version of New York, New York by Frank Sinatra for their block right before 7 p.m. back in April. Yes, Brenna, and I love this video, and Bob, I think you will too. We're gonna go play that video now, and afterward, we'd like to give you a chance to respond. Wow, yeah, I I think the lady at the end really takes the cake. Soloist, I, <laughs> I wanna see her next single. Uh, but honestly, she's great. And it, it really made my heart very, very happy when I first saw that video. So Bob, I'd love to hear what you think of the scene in New York. You know, why have communities all across the world resorted to this group street singing? And how does this activity actually help us cope with the, as, as, as the singers and, as the viewers with the experience of the collective experience of COVID-19. Yeah, I think it's great. And I think ultimately what it does is it helps us connect to others at a time when that's difficult or at a time when we can't connect to others in the ways we're used to. Uh, but kind of looking at it more broadly, if we look at how human beings naturally make music throughout history and all around the world, one aspect of music making is, is, I would say, universal, and that is the social. When people gather together socially, they often include music, or from a slightly different perspective, uh, when people feel like being musical, they usually do it with others. So in a sense, these kinds of things that, that of people being musical during the pandemic that we're seeing, they're not surprising or remarkable. Rather, they're really to be expected. Mm. It's, it's just people being people because people are naturally musical. And I personally love, well, I personally love Frank Sinatra music, but I, I also just, I just, I love ways that, that people do music that emphasize the social, that, inter, that emphasize interaction between people, um, which um, Ryan, you and I talked previously about my love for karaoke. Yes. And, um, <laughs> And anybody, uh, any of my former students or people I've worked with over the last five years know that uh, I'm a, very much an advocate for karaoke. And uh, if you give me an opportunity, I will say it is not the kind of drunken silliness that uh, it sometimes uh, characterized as. On our uh, street. <laughs> that, that, is, that, that is probably the the big musical thing that I miss during this pandemic is actual in-person karaoke. I have seen uh, the role that, that those musical experiences can play, extremely meaningful roles 
that it can play in the lives of people who, who would not have a way to connect or a way to be creative or artistic uh, if they didn't have uh, weekly karaoke at the at the local tavern. I mean, it, it, and now that's just one example of how people gather together to be musical. And um, I think those types of things are great because they they allow people to connect. They allow people to be expressive. And um, I mean, I think we're really, these kinds of things are really hitting on the core of what it means to be a human. So yeah, I think these are, are really important topics that, that we're covering here. Uh, I, one, I really appreciate your impassioned uh, defense and expression of karaoke as an art form. I don't think I've ever heard that, but but the way you describe it, it's very true. That's a lot of, for a lot of people, that is potentially the only time that they might ever perform in front of a group of people. And as a performer, like it yeah. seems not as important to me, but thinking about other people, I think that that is, that's really insightful. And yeah, and I, I would just, I would just think that when you talk about music being human and how how everyone is musical and how we're how we're coming to our roots with that at the beginning of the pandemic they talked a lot about that with like family everyone coming together and coming home and, and living with each other and being around each other all the time and it's nice to know that music is a part of that coming yeah. together and a part of root of who we are it sure it sure can be and I think uh, it only enhances life. Uh, yeah, if you notice in some of the videos that we've seen of people doing music uh, through social distancing or doing it remotely, I mean, the music itself is not always that great from an objective standpoint. <laughs> uh, you know, the singing is not always great. And But I think in these moments, we're more inclined to kind of look past that and we notice that the human connection that's being accomplished through this not so great singing or whatever and we should be like that all the time and that's again what i like about karaoke is somebody will get up there and they may not be that great of a singer but they they're up there and you can tell they're loving the opportunity to sing and express themselves and usually if they're not objectively good people still respect that component of it and so they clap which just it's just great and i think there's too much kind of music and arts criticism going on you know the simon cowell perspective that it's kind of sport to just ridicule somebody for not sounding good when they sing and I'm not fond of that well thank you i i completely agree i'm also not fond of that as well <laughs> And I'm glad that, you know, with music coming back and people coming back to their roots and everyone kind of making music and creating their own art, that that becomes the norm and not the not the criticism. So uh, thank you so much for all your expertise and for talking with us today, Dr. Woody. Um, it's been an incredibly insightful conversation and we're looking forward to the next time we can have you on. Great, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Wow. Um, that so many of those statements he made, they really made an impact on me. Like I said before, the whole entire rumination thing, that's like yeah. unlocking a part of myself that I didn't realize. Or, you know, it's kind of like one of those things I'm like, oh, so that's why I do that. So that's really cool. I like having kind of those aha moments like that. And I think it was interesting how he kind of talked about how music both heals us as individuals, but also as it has like a collective healing. So I think it just the way that it doubles and helps everyone in different ways is definitely really, really cool. I'm glad we got that scientific explanation for that. Yeah. And you know, all throughout Dr. Woody's interview, I kept thinking about how we're coming to the start of school this fall and how the school offers a real world application of musical psychology and coping with the pandemic through music in terms of choir, band, and theater. Activities that are incredibly impactful on the young people in our community. Ryan, do you want to introduce us to your friend who has been teaching music to middle schoolers remotely during the pandemic? 
For sure. Uh, our next guest today is Drew Ferkins, who is a recent UNL alum and vocal music teacher at Russell Middle School in Omaha, Nebraska, where he directs the choirs, two show choirs, an acapella group, and a musical, in addition to being a show band director at Millard West High School. So he's Ooh. a busy guy. <laughs> Drew continued to teach music and coach his acapella group Wolfgang online throughout the pandemic and received an amazing reaction to the acapella group's remote performances, which went viral on social media. I sat down with Drew last week to talk about the community's reaction to him and his students' work, his experiences teaching music from home, and what it's been like beating back isolation through song and leading his students through a pandemic. Hi, Drew. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, I'm so excited to uh, get to talk to you today, and uh, I think our audiences are really going to enjoy what you have to say. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Yeah. So uh, can you tell our viewers a bit about who you are and what you do? Um, I, like I said, like you said, I'm Drew Ferkins. Um, I'm the vocal music teacher at Russell Middle School, which is um, in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, I'm just about to start my second year of teaching. Um, I do show choirs, acapella groups, musical show bands, um, work with a few different uh, groups of people around the Omaha area. So what was it like to having to transition to teaching choir remotely with the pandemic and everything that happened? You know, uh, how did you and your right. students adjust? Choir is such a, you know, group activity. It's designed to help you be collaborative and work together as a team. That's one of the biggest skills that we kind of strive for as music educators. Um, so kind of re, uh, tweaking that and just figuring out how to put that virtually was a mystery to me and still, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, the biggest thing I wanted was just to supply that kind of safe place for the kids to be themselves and feel comfortable um, because they're not going to have that. They're not going to be able to hang out with their friends and for a while, all those things. So that was the biggest thing. Um, I was going for. But most of the singing I had them do was kind of teaching them um, music all together and then having them kind of practice it using some software um, that our district got for us and then recording themselves and um, sending it back to them. Um, and they adjusted mostly um, positively, I mean, as, as best as they could have. Really, I think the best thing for them was just seeing each other and getting to exist in the choir environment, just keeping that connection with the people um, that really they connect with the most during school. So one of the reasons why we're talking today, as you know, is that you had a couple of videos of your various choirs performing that went a little bit viral. Can you tell us about them? Yes, so we just started a acapella group um, this year at Russell. And so we continue to meet our little uh, outside of school group um, after our school hours on Zoom. And we had one song, we had a couple songs learned, but we had just finished a pretty difficult song. The kids were super excited to sing. Um, and so I put together a little recording project for them. Um, and so they sent me like videos of them singing um, their parts that they had learned. And then I kind of put them all together in a virtual choir of sorts um, and put it out to the world and then we decided to do another one because the first one was super successful and the reaction from the community was just so worth it. I would do it again in a heartbeat. What, so, what was yeah. that reaction like from the community? Um, yeah, our I think total our videos got over like 25,000 views like combined wow. on Facebook and YouTube. I I got emails from like a bunch of teachers like throughout the district and parents and stuff um, just saying how much like their performance probably meant to them and also meant to the people viewing. You know, that's really what like, you know, the importance of music is like not only in general, but in a time in a, in a pandemic where people are separated and it's just a glooming sadness, right? Yeah. And people need that music and that connection um, to just get through it all. So right. a little bit earlier, we spoke to uh, Dr. Woody, who I, I believe that you had as a music ed professor yeah. at UNL. <laughs> um, 
And in our interview with him, he spoke a lot about how music making is a natural human way to share expression um, and how we can use music making as a way to cope during these extended periods of isolation. And I know, you know, you said that creating these videos and teaching choir remotely has been a ton of work, which, um, you know, you've, you've made clear that you're ready for the challenge and that you've, you've, you've come to the challenge. Um, so what, what's motivated you to go this extra mile for your students? Well, a hundred percent, it's just been like them really, just like getting to see their, their faces each week and their reaction, like when you're like super down in the dumps, like quarantine in the middle of April, like that was really like the biggest thing that kept me going is just their energy and their attitudes. And I kind of wanted to be like kind of the representation of that positivity for them as well. Um, Cause as teachers, all we can ask for our students and the biggest thing that we hope that they take to high school and college and just life skills in general is like, positivity, optimism, adaptability. So I, I've got to show that in myself if I'm going to expect them to be able to, you know, have those skills. Tell me, are you just getting by, by, by? Where there is desire, there is gonna be a flame. Where there is a flame, someone's bound to get burned. But just because it burns doesn't mean you're gonna die. You gotta get Well, sure. uh, the episode, you know, this episode today is called You've Got to Go Get Up and Try. So we were oh. definitely <laughs> impressed. Um, I love it. Yeah. Did, was there anything that any of your students by chance said that, you know, really resonated with you that you can think of? Oh, um, I don't know. M maybe not something like super specific, um, but I just remember the very last rehearsal Zoom meeting we had all together as a group. Um, I wasn't really expecting this to happen, but we kind of, I was getting a bit emotional saying my goodbyes to this group, you know, first year of the group, my first year teaching. So it was a group that really meant a lot to me. And about half of the kids went around and just spoke about how much this like experience in the group meant to them and was a family to them during school and outside of school. And I just wasn't expecting that at all because you don't usually get middle schoolers who are too outspoken about that kind of stuff and it's a group of seventh and eighth graders um so but yeah we had a lot of like more soft-spoken kids just kind of speak up about how much this group meant to them and that just like that's like all i can ask for as an educator just to like affect them in that way and give them that experience so that was like the most meaningful thing ever <laughs> so we'll be rooting for you and um i'm looking forward to seeing um how how you guys handle um the upcoming school year and i have no doubt in my mind that um you will continue to make a lasting impact on these kids and thank them you. on you <laughs> thank you yes absolutely thank Alrighty. So yes thank you uh drew this conversation was lovely and enlightening and um i think our viewers appreciate it as well Wow, one of the things that that I remember about getting Drew um, on the episode was seeing that video of Try the Full Video on Facebook. And, you know, just going back to everything that Dr. Woody said with music psychology, that that really did it for me. I don't, I don't know if it was because they were kids and I, I love it when kids sing, um, but, but the lyrics and, just all the effort that went into it and and the students and Drew continuing to create art throughout the pandemic and and despite their circumstances was was just so inspirational and i think that 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 main line you got to get up and try can mean so many things for so many people right now for the lead center with you know how we are figuring out how to do shows during a pandemic and and not giving up and really working hard to deliver uh, deliver live performances for the community i think that that is that 
is it definitely an interpretation, but for me, it reminds me of, so my aunt, she was diagnosed with COVID-19 um, at the end of May, right after Memorial Day. And she spent all of June, um, over 30 days in the ICU intubated. Um, it's very, COVID-19 is real and is dangerous. And she was sed pretty much sedated for most of, most of um, her hospitalization. And, you know, there's no cure. There's, there's no cure. There are some treatments that sometimes work, sometimes don't. And one of the thing that one of the things that the doctors encourage you to do, if you can, if there are nurses who are there to help you, is to call your loved ones, and even though they can't respond, to to talk to them. Or I, I, one of the things they suggested was to play music. So I would play her favorite song that she actually taught me to sing on the karaoke. Now I'm making all these connections with what Dr. Woody said. Um, my heart will go on in Tagalog because um, I'm half Filipino and my aunt. Um, is Filipina. And I, I did, we, that's what one of the things that we did for her. And I, I remember calling every day, the nurse, you know, checking in on FaceTime and then just placing the phone by her ear. And that's what we did. And thank God she ended up recovering, you know, after it took over a month, but she, she's on the road to recovery. It's, it's long, but it, it just demonstrates for me that there are, there can be a physiological impact that music can have on, on people. One that we probably will never understand entirely, but that we all know and we can all see. Unfortunately, I think it looks like we're having a couple technical difficulties. Um, I'm, I'm just going to close things off really quickly here. Uh, before we go, we're super excited because we just announced our 2020-2021 season at the Lead Center. Things are definitely going to look a little different. Uh, we'll be wearing masks, utilizing a new air filtration system, social distancing, and cleaning high touch cleaning high touch surfaces frequently. However, the arts are coming back, and I, for one, am very excited to see Derek Davis's show, um, his solo show that's coming to the lead in October. So get your tickets ASAP at, on our website. And if you enjoyed spending time with us today, we encourage you to donate to the Lead Center's COVID-19 relief fund to ensure that the arts and programming like this remain an essential part of the Lincoln community. You can find the donation link on our website. And that just wraps up this episode of Lunch and Learn. If you are interested in checking out Dr. Robert Woody's new book, Becoming a Real Musician, you can snag a copy on Amazon or through the link on our website. And finally, make sure you mark your calendars because we'll be back with a brand new episode on Tuesday, September 1st at noon. And I think we have sound for you, Brenna. Are you back? Do we? Do we? Am I yes, back? Yes, yes, we oh can hear gosh, you. Oh my gosh, thank God. Yes, awesome. <laughs> Um, and a special thanks to Brenna. I'm so glad we got your sound back. This is Brenna's <laughs> last episode with us uh, today here with Lunch and Learn. And we're, we are very thankful for, you know, all the work that you did to put this project together. And I'm very grateful as, as my co-host. And we're looking forward for our next episode. Sapphire Toth, our new education outreach intern, will be joining us. Woo woo! Yes, and a special thanks as well to Stephen Colonna in the virtual control room, Liv LeBlanc, Matthew Bourne and Lauren Durbin in marketing, and Sasha Dobson and Jane Shearmeyer Hansen in the education department. This series would not be possible without their support. And before we sign off today, we have a special performance from Drew's a cappella group, Wolfgang, performing their emotional and heartwarming arrangement of Try by Pink. Stay tuned to the stream to experience the magic at Russell Middle School that went viral and inspired a community. We'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs>
doesn't mean you're gonna die You gotta get up and try and try and try You gotta get up and try and try and try You gotta get up and try and try and try You want to cry When you're out there doing what you're doing Are you just getting by? Tell me, are you just getting by, by, by? Where there is desire, there is gonna be a flame Where there is a flame, someone's bound to get burned But just because it burns doesn't mean you're gonna die gotta get up and try and try and try You gotta get up and try and try You gotta get up and try and try and try You gotta get up and try and try